Released by Square in 1991 on the Super NES, series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi returns to write and direct the next installment in the Final Fantasy franchise. Often regarded as one of the best games in the RPG genre, much less its own franchise, Final Fantasy IV was a blend of successful elements from its three radically different predecessors, and is noteworthy for significantly advancing the quality of dramatic storytelling for not just a central main character, but an entire cast. For gameplay, because the design emphasis was about the story, there is essentially no character customization across the cast of 12 playable characters, of which 5 could be fielded in battle at the same time. The biggest change was the introduction of the Active Time Battle, or ATB system, which suddenly made all battles micromanaged in real time, as enemies and allies both were constantly acting upon action recharge meters. In addition, enemies could now change form and battle tactics mid-fight to add a layer of depth to combat. Also, as this was the first installment on the Super NES, the project enjoyed a significant boost in graphics as well as audio quality. Keep in mind this footage is the original Japanese release fan translated to English, as the original American release was a modified and censored version called Final Fantasy II, so don't mind spelling discrepancies. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. The game begins with a Dark Knight Cecil of the Red Wings Air Force experiencing a crisis of conscience as he's returning from a mission of forcibly retrieving the water crystal from the town of Mycidia, forcibly killing anyone in his way. The captain of the guard senses this and passes this along to the King of Baron before Cecil makes his report. After delivering the crystals, he boldly questions the legitimacy of their actions as it seems inconsistent with their motivations. The King doesn't answer and instead considers his questions a crime to the throne and thus strips him of command of the Red Wings. He is demoted to monster elimination, but his friend, the Dragoon Knight Kane, attempts to plea for reconsideration. The King tasks them both with a mission to defeat some phantom beasts in the northern town of Mist, and hands them a ring to deliver to the town. As he preps to leave, Cecil finds that others have noticed how irrational the King has been lately, but all have been too scared to confront him on it like Cecil had. However, Kane still has faith in the King and thinks doing their next mission will improve his mood. He also reminds him that the king raised them both as practical sons since both of their real fathers died. He's welcomed back by his love interest, the White Mage Rosa, as well as his friend and chief engineer, Sid, who agrees that the king's acting very strange lately. Passing through the foggy cave leading to Mist Village, Cecil and Kane are haunted by deterring words, though they push on to discover the fog centralizing into the form of a dragon. Defeating the mysterious phantom beast, they enter the village of Mist, though as soon as they do, a legion of fiery bomb monsters erupt out of the ring they were to deliver and proceed to burn the village down. Cecil is horrified and hears the nearby crying of a young girl lamenting her mother, whose dragon suddenly died. Kane realizes this link as a trait of summoners, and Cecil realizes they have indirectly killed this girl's mother personally. Kane states they must follow orders and leave no survivors, but Cecil draws the line here at this dishonorable slaughter. He severs all ties to kingdom and country, and to a surprise, Kane agrees with him. He points out their best chance is to warn the other kingdoms of Baron's power trip, and rescue their friends and Rosa from harm's reach. They move to rescue the girl, and not surprisingly, she doesn't trust her mother's killers. Forced to knock her out, they pressure her into using her summoning magic to call forth Titan, who creates an earthquake that brings down a nearby mountain wall. Cecil wakes up and sees the girl escaped with him unharmed, but Kane is nowhere to be seen. Fleeing and crossing the desert to the oasis town of Kaibo, he nurses the girl back to health. When he wakes up, he apologizes for killing her mother and states he wants to make amends by protecting her. While resting, a general of Baron storms in with troops stating that all people of Mist are to be executed and Cecil stands his ground, proving his word to the girl. She begins to trust him slowly and opens up by introducing herself as Rydia, and in the town, Cecil hears of another woman from Baron who had been taken in. He investigates and finds it was Rosa who chased after him, and ended up sick with desert fever along the way. Hearing of the cure in the form of a gem in a faraway antlion chamber, Cecil takes Rydia with him to help Rosa. Along the way in an underground lake, they meet an old man Cecil recognizes as the sage, Tella, who says he needs his help to overcome a strong monster blocking his way to saving his daughter from a bard that took her to the kingdom of Domsian. They agree to help each other and continue on, with Cecil and Rydia proving able to help Tella defeat the imposing Octomammoth in their way. Arriving at Domsian Castle, they find it in ruins under a recent attack, and among the recent victims they unfortunately find Tella's daughter, Anna. The bard in question arrives, and Tella immediately assaults him. The bard doesn't fight back as he tries to explain, though fortunately Anna is still barely alive to break up the fight. She explains the bard is actually Prince Edward of Domsian in disguise, also going by the name Gilbert. Gilbert then explains a dark knight named Golbez was recently put in charge of the Red Wings, 
bombed the castle with his airship fleet, killed nearly everyone, and took their kingdom's fire crystal. Anna passes away, and Tella storms off, swearing revenge on Golbez. Gilbert, however, is a self-admitted coward, but Riddy and Cecil slap him and tell him to man up, starting with helping them get the cure for Rosa in the nearby antlion chamber, which he can help with by using his hovercraft to get them there. Descending deep into the antlion chamber, Gilbert is surprised by the sudden aggression of the normally peaceful antlion monsters, and they are forced to defeat it. As they grab the cure for Rosa, Cecil notes the sharp rise of hostile monsters, though they hurry to Rosa's bedside. As she recovers, she explains that though the King of Baron is assigning more and more power to Golbez, it's actually Golbez controlling everything, including the hunt for the Four Crystals. In addition, his next target is the Wind Crystal in Fabule, so she joins them as they make that their next priority. That evening, Gilbert goes to a nearby lake to mourn for Anna, and his music attracts the attention of a monster that attacks him. During the fight, the ghost of Anna appears to bolster his self-confidence and push him to joining the fight against Golbez. As they travel to Fabule, they pass through Mount Hobbs, where Rydia gets over her trauma of her village burning down, and at the peak of the mountain, they see a monk of Fabule defending off some monsters. They aid him, and he introduces himself as Yang, captain of the monks of Fabule, and the last of his unit as the rest were killed by the monsters. They inform him of the plot against Fabule's wind crystal, and Yang suspects this recent ambush is no coincidence. They band together and hurry to Fabule, where they meet with the king and warn him of the attack. He's cautious that a Dark Knight from Baron is the one bringing the news, but Yang vouches for him and Gilbert steps up to inform him of the attack of Domsian and also support Cecil. Fortunately, they have enough time to set up defenses before the invasion comes, but Baron proves overwhelming as the best Yang can muster is a fighting retreat. They are pushed all the way back to the Crystal Room when suddenly Kane steps out. Cecil greets his friend whom he thought he lost, but Kane is strangely consumed with killing Cecil. Cecil loses the duel, but Rosa comes in to stop their fight. Cain is somehow staggered before Rosa, but Golbez himself makes an appearance, blasting them all aside to make way to the crystal. Golbez chooses not to kill Cecil, and instead wants to meet him again, so he steals away Rosa to ensure this and orders Cain to grab the crystal, which Cain unquestionably obeys. Rydia cures the three men and cheers them up for the recent wave of complete failures, and now they focus on how to best enter Baron to rescue Rosa and stop Golbez. Cecil knows the country has a weak navy since it focused its military might on air and land, so Yang charters a ship from the king and they set off. On the way there, Cecil explains that they need to find Sid first, but their voyage is interrupted by an encounter with the legendary Leviathan. Getting caught in a stormy whirlpool, Rydia falls overboard and Yang dives in to try and rescue her. Gilbert takes a critical blow and is knocked out, and as the ship is sucked in, Cecil is cast away. He wakes up on the shores of Mycidia, and his conscience compels him to seek forgiveness for the destruction and murder he wreaked there earlier. Predictably, the villagers scorn him, but the Elder senses some honesty in him, so he hears him out. Cecil relays the trials and tribulations of the loss of his friends, loved ones, kingdom, title, and even self-worth, but sincerely wants to save everyone. The village Elder tells him he must first save himself, and must purify himself of darkness in the nearby Mount Ordeals if he is to defeat the evil he himself was a part of before. Cecil is warned that most who endure the trial there die, but Cecil unwaveringly accepts the challenge. His dark arts are useless on the mountain, so the Elder assigns the brother and sister twin mages, Palum and Porum, to escort him. Both are very powerful despite their young age, as Porum is a responsible and polite young girl, but her brother Palum is a loud and cocky young lad. At the same time, Golbez knows Cecil is climbing Mount Ordeals to become a paladin, and to curb this threat he sends one of his four fiends, the Emperor of Earth, Skarmiglion, to kill him before that happens. Back with Cecil, as he climbs the mountain, he encounters Tello the Sage again, who informs him he's looking for the powerful spell Meteor, and Palum and Porum recognize the famous Sage from being in the same village as them. Tella explains he intends to use Meteor to kill Golbez, and acknowledges he's too old to survive the strain of casting the spell, Still, he joins up with them again to help beat Golbez, and so Cecil is now joined by two mages young enough to be his children, and one old enough to be his father. However, as they reach the top of the mountain, the undead Skarmiglione appears before them with an undead horde in tow to kill them all. Fortunately, the trio of mages are able to run Wingman for an impaired Cecil, and they beat back the Emperor of Earth. However, death only empowers him as he rises again in his true undead form, and attacks them from behind with his powerful poison. Still, they succeed in defeating him again as he falls off the mountain. Within the sacred testing grounds, Cecil is faced with his own reflection, when suddenly it grants him a holy blade and cleanses him with sacred light. However, the true trial is apparent as the reflection steps out and he must defeat his former dark self, and prove darkness and hatred have left his heart. The reflection mysteriously and frequently refers to him as Sun, 
and Cecil not only passes the trial of Paladin Hood, but Tella suddenly recalls all of his forgotten spells, and learns Meteor from the light as well. On the way down, they discover a hidden forest of riding birds, and find multiple varieties of chocobo. After getting healed by a white one, they ride a yellow chocobo back to Mycidia, where the townsfolk are stunned at Cecil's success. Even more surprising, they find engraved on his holy blade is Mycidia's legend, which, while they don't understand its message, understand that Cecil is a destined hero to save the world. The Elder undoes a seal on the nearby Devil's Road that leads back to Baron, and as Cecil and Tella leave, the twins insist on coming along. Devil's Road is a teleportation transporter and leads to a similar room in the village of Baron, and as they emerge, they spot Yang alive and well, though he attacks Cecil unexpectedly. They fight, and afterwards, Yang is knocked back to his senses. He was apparently placed under mind control as they was captured by Baron, and Radio was swallowed by Leviathan, and Gilbert is nowhere to be found. As they rest, Yang finds he was given an entry key to the castle, so they have a way in. Sneaking in, they encounter Guard Captain Bagan, and though he is not mind controlled, he is still a loyal servant of Baron, and attacks the party with a horrific transformation. Slaying him and making their way to the throne room, they confront the king who already knew of Cecil's holy anointing somehow. Suddenly, the king begins spouting how he killed the real King Baron, who was honorable till the end. It turns out the replacement killer is actually another of the four fiends in disguise, the Emperor of Water, Cognazzo. After ending the imposter, Sid suddenly bursts in, but he sees he missed the fight. Seeing his friend also free of mind control, Sid is introduced to the party and in turn guides him to his latest airship creation. However, on the way there, Cognazzo uses his dying breath and catches them in a room trapped with crushing walls. Left with no option, Paladin and Porm decide to sacrifice themselves for the mission, bracing themselves against the wall and then petrifying themselves to halt the trap. Even Tella cannot lift their magic, and this maddens them all towards Golbez even more. Also, at the same time, Kane suggests to Golbez a plot to use Rosa as a bargaining chip and force Cecil to collect the last crystal and trade her for it. Golbez allows it, and Kane leaves to deliver the message. Sid takes the group to his hidden hangar where he unveils his best ship to date, the Enterprise. Lifting off, the ship is immediately hailed by another airship, and it's Kane to deliver the deal that if Cecil retrieves the Earth Crystal of Troia, then he can exchange it for Rosa, otherwise they'll kill her. Sid joins the team as Cecil decides to go next to Troia. There, the four guys not only find a ranch of black chocobos, capable of flying, but also catch the late-night showgirls. They then visit the priestesses guarding over the crystal, but find it was already stolen by the nearby Dark Elf. The Dark Elf is weak to metal weapons, so he's hidden himself and the crystal in a cave he's enchanted with powerful magnetism, so anyone with metal is paralyzed. In addition, they find Gilbert, alive after all, but critically wounded from the Leviathan attack. He cannot fight, but hands them an echoing device to help them defeat the Dark Elf they must confront. Gearing themselves in non-metal arms and armor, they catch a black chocobo and fly to the Dark Elf's cave. Making their way through the cave, they find the Dark Elf with the crystal, fight him, but soon find they are unable to stand firm against his powerful magic. At the same time, Gilbert senses the others are in danger and drags his broken body to his harp and begins playing. His music is relayed through the echoing device he gave them earlier, and his bardic music not only reinvigorates the party, but disrupts the Dark Elf to the point where he cannot use his gravity magic anymore. Re-equipping themselves with metal, they exploit the Dark Elf's weakness, force him to change form into a dragon, destroy him, and claim the Earth Crystal. Returning to Troia, Kane contacts Cecil to make the trade, and they stop to thank Gilbert, who explains he knew songs that could ward off evil spirits like the Dark Elf, and his bravery has even impressed Tella. As they leave, Kane escorts them to Golbez, though they must climb another tower to meet with Golbez and Rosa. As they climb the many floors of the Tower of Zot, they are halted by the three Magus sisters, under another fiend, the Empress of Wind, Barbaricia. The three sisters, Dog, Mag, and Rag, are defeated by the men, and they make it to Golbez. Cecil hands over the crystal, but Golbez refuses to hand over Rosa, and Tella knocks aside Cecil to charge directly at Golbez. The passionate old sage puts his entire life on the line to avenge Anna as well as all of the comrades who had fallen along the way, and he unleashes the almighty meteor magic. He blows past Golbez's defenses, and though Golbez does not die, he is wounded enough to pull back with the crystal. In addition, though he's been weakened enough to lose mind control over Kane, he still has enough power to blow away Cecil. Suddenly, he pauses after a good look at Cecil, and withdraws without saying a word. Cecil turns to Tella, who really couldn't take the strain of using the ultimate magic, and the old sage passes away, burdening Cecil with another lost comrade. However, Kane snapped too, and he's back to his old self. Together, they rescue Rosa just in the nick of time, and after Cecil lovingly embraces Rosa, Kane apologizes profusely to them all. 
Reunited with his old friends, they turn to leave, but the Empress of Wind herself is there to prevent her escape. Fortunately, thanks to Kane's aerial combat maneuvers, they counter Barbaricia, though the tower begins to fall after her defeat. Rosa warps them all back to Baron Castle, and Kane explains that he's learned while under Golbez's control. He explains Golbez may have all the light crystals, but he doesn't have any of the dark crystals, which are all located underground. Once he has both sets of crystals, he intends to open a way to the moon, whatever that means. He hands them a stone that can open a path to the underworld, though doesn't know where or how to use it. They travel the world for clues, including a visit to Mithril Town, a strange town of Master Smith frogs, beavers, and miniature people, though in the town of Dwarven Descendants, Agard, they learn a few interesting things. First, that the Red Wings fleet has already found a way underground, and then that this world has two moons, one of which seems to be inhabited. Dropping their magma key down the town well, the ground starts to quake beneath them as a nearby mountain range suddenly collapses as a giant rift opens up. Descending with the Enterprise, they discover an entire subterranean world, but happen to get caught between a massive firefight between the Red Wings battleships and Dwarves tank battalion. Shot down, Sid lands them safely near the Dwarven castle of King Geo. They speak with the King and communicate that they're there to help, as Golbez has claimed two of the four Dark Crystals already. They can't use their airship until Sid upgrades it with a mithril hull to withstand the intense heat down here, so he leaves to work on the ship. A dwarven girl named Luca mentions that she lost her doll somewhere, and suddenly Yang sees something suspicious behind the throne where the crystal is kept. They follow, and suddenly find themselves trapped in the crystal room, as Luca's doll suddenly had become possessed by Golbez in attack. Destroying the creepy poltergeist Calcabrina, the doll still manages to relay its location to Golbez, who warps to the location. He tells them he expects to find immense power on the moon, and proceeds to kill them, summoning a shadow dragon to his side. Though things look tense, suddenly a powerful mist dragon appears, dispelling the shadow dragon, Cecil is healed up suddenly, and an older Rydia appears with a variety of summoned monsters at her side. Her army of summons beat down Golbez, and she explains that when she was swallowed by Leviathan, she was taken to the Phantom World, where she actually befriended and trained up with them in the Land of the Fae. Because the flow of time is different there, it's why she's no longer a little girl, but now a matured young lady. However, Golbez refuses to die and manages to swipe the crystal and escape. Fortunately, though there is only one crystal left to protect, it's in a sealed room with only one key that Golbez doesn't have, so they have a little bit of time to counterattack. While Golbez is focused on the last crystal, King Geo plans to attack the Tower of Babel, where the other seven crystals are, and steal them all back in one fell swoop. After visiting the secret development room, and reading some interesting articles out of an important document, they use the Dwarven tank assault on the tower as cover in order to sneak in and begin climbing the incredibly tall base. As they near the top, they overhear the last of the four fiends, the Emperor of Fire, Rubicon, report that the castle of ninjas, Eblin, has already fallen and he takes his leave. Evil Dr. Luguay is now in charge of the operation and sends one of his creations out to the party once he spots them. After dealing with the creation as well as a transformed doctor, the doctor sputters out that a giant cannon is fixed on the dwarves to annihilate them all at once. Making haste to the control room of the cannon, they find the operators defiantly smash the weapon controls, and with no time left to act, Yang hurls everyone out of the control room and sacrifices himself to blowing up with the massive weapon. Before they can follow after the crystals, Golbez destroys the bridge they are on, and the group is falling to their death. Fortunately, Sid flies in with an upgraded Enterprise to catch them in midair just in the nick of time, though an upgraded Red Wing ship immediately gives chase. Figuring he cannot allow Golbez to leave the underground, Sid tells them that to seek his apprentices in Baron, straps himself down with explosives, and leaps overboard, throwing insults to Golbez as he blows himself up in a megaton explosion that seals up the hole to the surface. Everyone is dismayed at the fast rising body count for their mission, but Cecil grimly keeps them focused. Sid's apprentices attach a skyhook to the Enterprise, allowing them to deploy the hovercraft they need to reach the castle of Eblon near the surface side tower of Babel. In an underground passage leading to the castle, they find the defeated remnants of Eblon, learn the king and queen were captured, and find the prince is on his way to rescue them. Following behind him, they find the prince losing a personal duel with Rubicon, who chooses to leave him and warp away. Despite his bad attitude and foul mouth, the ninja prince Edward, also called Edge, is powerful and honor-bound. He has no problems thinking out loud as he joins the party to give chase to Rubicon, and united, they resume their climb of the Tower of Babel. Ascending, they find the king and queen of Eblin, but something is wrong as they've been turned into horrific monsters and attack. Refusing to fight, Edge's cries reach them, and they not only gain their human sanity for a while, but choose to commit suicide. 
Rubicant appears and actually apologizes to them as he didn't know Dr. Lugay had experimented on the king and queen who turned them into abominations. Edge's rage gives rise to stronger power and the party clashes with the Honorable Emperor Fire after he restores their health in order to fight a fair fight. He loses and chooses to step aside and leave them be. However, it turns out the Crystal Room was trapped, for as soon as they enter the chamber they all fall into a pit trap that deposits them back into the underground layer of the tower. Fortunately, they find the enemy's hangar and steal one of the Red Wings' new model ship, using it to fly back to the Dwarven Castle. The King hands them the key to the final seal for safeguarding, and later they are surprised to find Sid, more alive and in one piece than they would have expected him to be, for someone who strapped enough bombs on him to blow up a mountain range to close a hole in the earth. Sid rises up to upgrade their new ship, but still needs to rest before he can fight. Now making their way to the final crystal to claim it before Golbez does, everything seems to be going well until they make their way out and accidentally trigger a trap, prompting a giant demon wall to quickly close in on them. Shattering it before it crushes them to death, they are about to exit when suddenly they hear Golbez's voice again, coaxing Kane back over under mind control. Kane succumbs to the influence and steals the last crystal, getting away with the final crystal Golbez needs to reach the moon. En route to chasing Golbez, they stop by the cave to the Phantom World in hopes of recruiting additional allies. Finding all manner of strange artifacts in the Fame March, they seek audience with the Phantom King and Queen, proving their might first against Queen Ashura, gaining her aid as a summon. They then challenge the King, who turns out was the Leviathan that crashed the world earlier. Proving their might against him, they gain his respect and aid as well. Then, venturing into the Cave of the Sylphs, they find Yang, not dead and merely unconscious despite detonating a giant death cannon with his bare hands. Reporting back to the Dwarven King with another failed attempt to protect the crystal, King Geot says their only hope is in the magical ship mentioned in the same legend the Elder of Mycenae mentioned. Putting the clues together, they all figure out Golbez's destination with the crystals must be Mycidia. Providing a means to the surface again, Sid climbs out of bed to attach a drill head to their new ship, dubbed the Falcon, and works himself to exhaustion again. Traveling back to the surface, they encounter a strange miniature man who asks for the rat tail they found in the Phantom World and exchanges it for a piece of very rare adamant ore. Also, they inform Yang's wife of his condition, and she gives him a frying pan to livingly knock himself awake with. Returning to Yang, it surprisingly works, but he's still too injured to fight for now. Instead, the fairies offer to fight in his stead and Rydia learns how to summon Sylph. Returning to his wife, she thanks them and takes back her frying pan, giving them a powerful meat cleaver to aid in their journey. Returning to the Baron Castle, they encounter the ghost of the late king, who explains he became a phantom beast after his murder. After testing the strength of Cecil, he lends them his power in the form of the powerful Odin. Finally, they use the recently acquired adamant to reforge Cecil's legendary sword into the mightier Excalibur Blade. Making it to Mycidia, they find the Elder leading everyone in prayer and suddenly a colossal airship, easily the size of a city itself, rising out of the sea. The Elder explains that when he was praying, a voice was beckoning towards Cecil to use this vessel to get to the moon. It turns out the magical ship, named the Lunar Whale, is a vessel capable of spaceflight and can get him to the moon. Entering the Lunar Whale, they find it comes equipped with resting areas and even a fat chocobo. Speaking to the voice-activated flight crystal, the ship is on autopilot as it takes them up and out of this world and onto one of the moons. Disembarking, they find it surprisingly hospitable and make their way to the giant crystal castle there, the home of the Lunarians. Cecil is personally greeted by Fusaya, guardian of the sleeping moon people, who explain the Lunarians were originally from a planet between the fourth and fifth planet of the solar system that has long since been destroyed. They built a spaceship and traveled to this current planet of blue, with most of them as space sleep to survive the trip. When they arrived, they found the races of the world too primitive to live with, so they created a second moon to sleep until the planet's people evolved enough. However, one person didn't want to live on the moon and instead wanted to wipe out all living things on the planet so the Lunarians could live on the blue planet instead. He created the Tower of Babel as a means to deliver mass destruction, but Fusaya forced him to sleep before he went too far. However, Batman's mind was still awake and developed tremendous psychic power to continue his mission of annihilation, making puppets of people with dark souls. Cecil quickly connects the dots and figures Golbez as merely one such puppet, and Fusuya reveals the name of this man to be Zemus. Zemus knew the crystals were just energy sources of the Lunarians and collected them to power the dimensional elevator in the Tower of Babel, which is really just a giant service elevator to transport a weapon of mass destruction from the moon to the planet. Zemus aside, the rest of the Lunarians wanted to live peacefully among the races of the planet once they evolved to the level they could effectively communicate with each other. 
the lunar whale was built by his younger brother Kluya as a means to travel between the moon and the planet, and has since been secretly aiding the development of technology in the world, as he was helping build transporters and teaching the secret of flight. After finding the town of Mycidia, Kluya fell in love with a woman there and they had two children, one of them being Cecil himself. Cecil at this time recalls that the mysterious presence on Mount Ordeals must have been his father Kluya as well. However, time is short and they need to shut down the tower before a massive space colossus descends and destroys everything. The impenetrable barrier surrounding the tower can only be undone by Fusio's Lunarian knowledge and so he joins the party. Along the way, they find the god of the phantom beasts on the moon and test their might against his awesome power to succeed and gain the ultimate summon, Bahamut. Lifting off and returning to the blue planet, they find they are too late for the descent of the Colossus of Destruction, the Giant of Babel, who immediately begins demolishing everything around it with every step. At this time, King Geod and the Dwarves, with Yang and the Sylphs, come rolling in with their tank battalion to throw everything they have at the Titan. Then Sid and the forces of Baron fly in to provide aerial bombardment with their new air fleet. Surprisingly, even Palin and Porum have been restored by the Elder and come with him and the residents of Mycidia to lend aid with their magic. In addition, even Gilbert and the forces of Domsian are back on their feet to bravely contribute to the battle as well. Everyone is giving everything they've got to destroy the giant and Fusia directs them to fly towards the mouth and get inside to destroy the monster. Jumping in and climbing through the sections of the Colossus to find its weak points, the group is suddenly halted by the four emperors, resurrected and empowered by Zemus. It's a 4 Fiend versus 5 Hero Throwdown in the Belly of the Beast, as Cecil and crew put them all down once more. Finding the control system in the creature's lungs acting as a giant heart, they destroy the defensive drones guarding it and succeed in crushing the heart, stopping the monster. Golbez comes out, frustrated at the crucial loss, but Fusaya quickly puts all of his energy into undoing Zemus' powerful grip on Golbez's mind, snapping him back to normal. Suddenly aware and horrified at the atrocities he's been committing, Fusia asks Golbez the name of his father, and Golbez replies it was Kluya. It's now revealed Golbez was actually the other half Lunarian son of Kluya and Cecil's missing older brother this entire time. Cecil is not only stunned at this revelation, but also how close this situation could have been reversed, as he could have been the mind controlled one too. However, time is short and Golbez and Fusia move on ahead to confront Zemus. The giant starts to fall, and Kane comes in to help them out, succeeding, and then apologizing for once again falling under mind control and helping cause the calamity in the first place. Zemus is on the moon, fighting with Golbez and Fusia, and Kane wants to come along and help fight. However, Edge still doesn't trust him. Kane understands, and gives him permission to kill him should he be turned again, which satisfies Edge, and they all head back to the moon. Back on the moon, they head to the crystal room where Zemus' body is kept, and the crystals all begin to speak to them now, sending the group to the core of the moon. Fighting on, they fight the White Dragon for the Murasama Blade, the Plague for the Holy Lands, a pair of Lunasauruses for the Ribbon Accessory, Dark Bahamut for the Ragnarok Blade, and Titarithian for the Masamune Blade. Finally, they arrive in time to see Golbez and Fusia combining forces to unleash a devastating double meteor attack to destroy Zemus, who laughingly states that he's been powerful even without his body and will live on. And as proof, the darkness in his body escapes out, fueled by Zemus' powerful hatred and powerful psychic abilities, calling itself Zeromus. Shockingly, even Meteor doesn't work, and Golbez thinks to use the crystals to reseal him again. However, Zeromus claims a person of darkness like Golbez cannot wield the light of the crystals and defeats everyone with his own meteor attack. Down on the surface, everyone is gathered together as the Elder pushes everyone to pray and send their hopes, wishes, dreams, and energy towards Cecil and friends to succeed. As Golbez hands Cecil the crystal, the paladin states his intent to destroy the evil once and for all. Unfortunately, during the fight, the group is struck down to the edge of death, though at this time the energy of everyone, living and dead, come forth with the twin mages Palam and Porum, Prince Gilbert and Tella the Sage, Yang the Monk and Sid the Engineer, and even Fusia the Lenarian and Cecil's brother Golbez, all coming together in spirit to revive and empower Cecil and crew to force out Zeromus's true form. As the heroes armed with the light of the crystals clash with the scorn and hatred of a dying and intolerant ancient, Cecil the Paladin, Radia the Summoner, Kane the Dragoon Knight, Rose of the White Mage, and Edge the Ninja destroy the incarnate evil mastermind, Zeromus. As Final Fantasy IV concludes, Fusia declares he will return to sleep until the planet is ready for Lunarians again, and Golbez insists he should set down and go to sleep as well to repent for all the harm he's done. 
As Golbez steps away, Cecil acknowledges him as his brother, which pacifies Golbez's heart a little. As they return to Earth, everyone goes their separate ways. The lunar whales return to the sea. Pal and Aporum continue their studies in Mycidia. Edge returns to his role as the new king of Eblin and discovers a new love for Rydia. Rydia herself returns to the Phantom World to advance relations between beasts and humans. Yang is crowned the new king of Fabul. Gilbert helps his people rebuild Domsian Castle and spread caring among the people. The dwarves are busy rebuilding their kingdom too, and Cain goes on a solo trip of redemption for himself. Finally, one of the moons breaks off and the Lunarian world travels away. As the game ends, it's a massive wedding for Cecil and Rosa, as they are also the newly crowned king and queen of Baron, though everyone but Cain is present. Final Fantasy IV has enjoyed the success of selling over 4 million copies worldwide.